Happy Father's Day to all you fathers at Valley, and it's great to have you join me for our study today in the book of Daniel. We're entering into chapter 3, and Kyle will have already read Daniel 3, 1 to 7. So let me open our time in prayer, and we'll dive right into our, uh, our passage. Father, thank you for being our perfect uh, Father, a heavenly Father, a Father that is without sin, a Father that always makes wise decisions, a Father that balances his holiness and his justice um, with his mercy and your grace. And Lord, thank you that, in at least in, in my life, I, I'm so grateful for your earthly Father you gave me, who's now with you, and all the things that he modeled for me that were so like you. And uh, for those of us who are fathers, um, I ask that you would give us wisdom and that we would be more like you every day as we pursue our walk with Jesus. Lord, for all of us, we ask for uh, just guidance in these difficult days. There's, there's just a lot going on in our world and in our community and in our culture that is troubling. And yet, as we go to Daniel, we're reminded that you're, you're in control, you're sovereign, you're working things out for our good and for your glory. But, but as those things work out, there are trials and there are tests along the way. So God, we want to be uh, strong in you, we want to be faithful to you, and we ask that as we enter into Daniel 3, which is perhaps one of the most well-known passages in all of Scripture, and we take our time through this passage that you would reveal to us truths that will help us uh, be more in love with you and weed out those areas of chaff in our lives that shouldn't be there. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Daniel 3. So we're going to be looking at the famous uh, passage of... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace, but we're not going to go there yet today. We're going to go there in a few weeks. We're going to uh, take about four or five weeks to, to walk through Daniel 3 because there's just a lot in here, a lot of practical things that we can learn from this passage. So we'll take our time through it. So today we're just going to look at verses 1 to 7. And again, this is the setting up of the golden image. And the context here is interesting because when we read the Bible, we often think that what takes place in one chapter and in the next chapter is just chronological. And it's just, you know, it, it, what happened in chapter two happened yesterday. And what happened in chapter three is happening today. That's not the case. Actually, the context is from chapter two to chapter three, uh, approximately 18 years have transpired between chapter 1 and 3. And uh, so this, um, scholars believe that chapter 3 is um, an advancement from the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. And thus about 18 years or so have transpired. And the third deportation uh, of the exiles from Judah has transpired so that this is about the time of 587 to 586 BC where um, the last exile from Judah has now been uh, deported to Babylon and Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. So, um, so the reign of Babylon at this point in history is very strong and they've, they've basically taken over all other people groups in their area. And, uh, and so Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar, you would think, based on the last thing he said in chapter 2, he, he gave glory to God, he acknowledged the greatness of God, and, and yet it seems like things have gone to his head, and here he develops uh, this image. And the reason this is important is because even though the image was an external image and the challenge to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was an external challenge to worship an idol, 
The reality is that you and I today have just as much a temptation to worship idols. And so what we're going to get into today is the whole idea of idolatry. And I don't think anybody in modern times has tackled the issue of idolatry better than Tim Keller. As a matter of fact, uh, here's... Sorry, I was, gonna, I was supposed to have this book out uh, to show you. But a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is from a book by Tim Keller called Counterfeit Gods. And the subtitle is The Empty Promises of Money, Sex, and Power, and the Only Hope That Matters. And Tim Keller just retired recently as the senior pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, New York. Very influential pastor. Uh, while he was there, the church grew to about 5,000, but probably even more Significant than that, they've planted over 100 churches in New York and over 200 churches in different uh, major cities of the world. And Tim Keller has a major heart for cities because cities tend to influence the rest of what goes on in countries. And they're sort of the centers of politics and journalism and laws and and on and on. So uh, Tim Keller's had a very influential a position in evangelicalism, and he's very smart, uh, very intelligent. He, he's been a seminary professor. Uh, but one of the things that he really emphasized in his ministry was talking about modern idols, modern idolatries. And oftentimes we don't think of ourselves as idolaters. We think that somebody in some remote place in the world that worships a, a, a fash, a, something fashioned out of wood or some kind of uh, object that they've made and they've called that a god. We think of that as idolatry. But it's really important that we that we broaden our thinking in regards to what what is it that we struggle with in relationship to idolatry. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have, as we looked at a few weeks ago, um, they would have known very well the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. And the very first commandment talks about idolatry. And as a matter of fact, what we're going to see as we go on in in this study is that really everything stems, all of our sins stem from the breaking of the first commandment. Uh, That if if we break the first commandment, it leads to the breaking of all the rest of the commandments. And without breaking that first commandment, we wouldn't break any of the other of the commandments. So Satan even knew this when he approached Adam and Eve in the garden. He, he, he basically wanted them to question the reality of God's authority in their life and that what God was said, said and what he was doing was actually good for them. So, um, so if we look at the first two commandments in your outlines, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. So this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does. He makes a huge 90 feet tall image that can be seen from for up to 15 miles, they said, from where it was placed in Dura, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water uh, below the earth. You shall not bow down. So this is the second Uh, commandment to them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments so what we have is we have Nebuchadnezzar establishing a uh, an image an idol that is to be worshiped without any respect of any persons at all. It's interesting that Daniel is nowhere to be found in Daniel 3, and scholars believe that Daniel was probably out of the nation at this time, away on official business for Babylon, and that's why he's not there. Uh, If he was there, I'm sure he would have done the same thing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do, as as we're going to see later in the chapter. Uh, But here we have tremendous pressure on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you can only imagine what that would be like for us if our culture set up some kind of image that in our community that we all had to be present at and bow down to 
And so that's external idolatry. Again, we've never faced anything like this, uh, but maybe we will someday. But again, in order to face something like that, it's important that you understand that where idolatry starts isn't on something that's posed to you from the outside. Idolatry starts on the inside. It, it starts in your heart. It starts in your soul. It starts in your innermost being. That's where idolatry begins. And so that's where I want to bring it to us today as far as really evaluating our own uh, proclivities towards idolatry. And I believe, I firmly believe that I still have idols in my life. I believe you have idols in your life. I believe every single Christian that's ever lived has continued to struggle with idolatry. And as we move through talking about this, I think you're going to see that that's, that's really the case. But God wants to liberate us from those idolatries, from anything that would take his place, from anything that we would put before him that would paralyze us in the process of bringing him glory and getting joy and satisfaction out of our lives because God created us to worship him and him alone and to have him in first place and nothing else in his place. So I just want to go quickly through some of the pressures that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were facing. I'm just going to read through these that are in your outline. But, but just quickly, in being forced to worship this golden image that is interesting because it, it personifies the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had 18 years before, and it seems like it was probably percolating in him uh, to enforce his control, to enforce his rule, to enforce his power, over Babylon and all the peoples that had been imported from other nations to unify them around this image that may or may not have looked like Nebuchadnezzar or, uh, or, or basically been sort of a mirror image of him in, in largesse. So first, it was set up in a unique location on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And Dura simply means wall or fortress. Uh, so we cannot be certain of a specific location. And the mention of Babylon recalls the story of the Tower of Babylon in Genesis chapter 11 and its goal of unifying all the nations and all the ethnies, the ethnic groups, all the peoples of the earth. Secondly, the who's who of Babylon was there. All the movers and shakers in Nebuchadnezzar's vast empire were invited to the dedication service. Third, Nebuchadnezzar set a time when national and religious allegiance to him would be put on public display with everyone participating. And this was a service of national, political, and religious unification. Fourth, grand and emotional music was to accompany the moment of dedication, adding a powerful psychological element to the service. And by the way, it's interesting that instruments, Persian instruments and Greek instruments as well as Babylonian instruments are named, which, uh, um, which leads us to believe also in an earlier date rather than a later date for Daniel uh, because of the instruments that are mentioned. It, it leads us to believe that it's true that Daniel was written in 605 BC or thereabouts uh, because of the instruments that are mentioned. They wouldn't have been, the same instruments most likely wouldn't have been mentioned in uh, two uh, 200 to 100 BC as liberal scholars uh, state. Uh, number five, a precise moment and specific uh, submission for worship. So it's, it's, it's basically a test and a pressure to worship something that you don't want to worship. And six, there's a death warning to anyone who refuses to fall down and worship. So again, a challenge to the very first two commandments that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought up with. Don't worship any other gods and don't bow down to any other gods. And then seventh, when the moment of commitment came, it appeared that everyone present pledged allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar and his idolatrous image. So in weeks to come, we're going we're gonna to go to that when that happens, when that encounter takes place. But for now, what I want to focus on is two aspects of idolatry. External, the external aspect, just like what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced from the outside, where, 
where persecution takes place or where we're forced to do something as believers that the Bible forbids. And what the Bible makes clear is that we're to obey government on everything unless it conflicts with uh, what the scriptures say. And so we're facing this now. I mean, this is big time in our court that we're having all kinds of laws established that conflict with our values and what the Bible teaches. So we do have to make tough decisions these days where some of the decisions we have to make actually go against government. And I, I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime, but we are seeing it. And uh, we're probably going to continue to see it at an even more rapid pace um, as we're finding out. So I, I just want you to know that forced idolatry or persecution from non-believers towards Jews and towards Christians has always been uh, happening around the world throughout history. And I just want to read through some passages. I'm going to read through these very quickly because I want to focus more on the internal idolatries than they fa that we face rather than the external idolatries. But I do want you to know that we're not to be surprised. We're not to be um, uh, alarmed. We're not, we're not to go, wow, what in the world's happening? Because the Bible makes it very clear that we're going to be persecuted, that we are going to suffer. And it's not if, it's when. And when you suffer or when you go through persecution, the Bible says, rejoice. <laughs> That's what it says. And the reason is because God knows and he's got a plan and he's going to redeem you, what you do and how you respond uh, in eternity. It may or may not happen now, uh, here and now, but in eternity we will be rewarded for our suffering and for our endurance and perseverance in the midst of difficulties. But I just want you to know uh, we are not a prosperity gospel church that teaches that something that the Bible doesn't teach, which the Bible never teaches that you're just, if you're a Christian, everything's going to be great and you're not going to have problems and you're going to be healthy and you're never going to get sick. The Bible never says that. The Bible is very clear that you're going to be persecuted and you're going to suffer. So I just want you to know, buck up. Being a Christian isn't easy. It's tough, but God gives us the resources to be strong and the grace we need to go through the things that he says we're going to go through. So let me read these real quick. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I just want to read these passages to you, uh, a sampling of what the Bible says about persecution and suffering. Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. So again, it may not, we may not get rewarded here. We may not uh, find that joy and that satisfaction here, but in heaven we will be blessed and rewarded. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you, Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Second Thessalonians 1, 4. The Apostle Paul said this, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in afflictions that you are enduring. He's writing to the church. He's encouraging them because they are being persecuted. They're enduring afflictions. And he says, um, you know, He's grateful for their steadfastness, for their endurance, for their perseverance in the midst of that. Second Timothy three eleven and 12. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. And then Paul writes about my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And as a matter of fact, if you read all the letters of Paul, you'll find out that he endured tremendous persecution, tremendous suffering, trials, tests, um, t torture, and eventually death uh, for his faith in Christ. So no prosperity gospel there. Um, yet from them, all the Lord rescued me. So in his case, he was rescued until the final time when he was killed for his faith. But indeed, all who desire, this is the point, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. If you, do you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Well, here's the good news. 
<laughs> you will be persecuted. That's what it says. So you want to be godly. You want to follow Christ. You're going to be, you're going to have temptations and tests and idols forced at you from the outside as well as from the inside. First Peter 4, 12 through 16. Peter says this, beloved, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon, when it comes upon you. It's going to come upon you, Christian, to test you. And don't think it's something strange that's happening to you. But what? Rejoice. <laughs> Here it is again. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So he says, you know, don't be happy if you're suffering for your own sin. But if you're suffering for what's right, rejoice. Jesus in John 16, 33 gave us this promise, which I love. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Not you might, not maybe, you will have tribulation. But he says, take a heart, I have overcome the world. And then in Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 35 to 39, the Apostle Paul says this. And earlier he said in Romans 8:18. Uh, that the sufferings of this world aren't worth comparing with the glories that will be revealed in us. And then he continues later in the passage, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as, as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we can be sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, uh, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 35 to 39. And then Paul succinctly in Philippians 1, 21 said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So the Christian perspective is that no matter what's going on from the outside, no matter what's going on in the inside, our life is no longer about us. It's about Christ. And when it's about Christ and you want to be godly, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to go through trials. You're going to suffer. And what's the antidote? Rejoice. <laughs> That's what he says every time. Rejoice. Be happy. Consider it a privilege that you get to suffer just as your Lord suffered and all those prophets and all the apostles and all the Christians throughout history that have suffered for him. Today, around the world, there are over 200 Christians today that will be martyred for their faith. They will die in faith. They will, they will be uh, pointed a gun at them. They will be in prison. They will be uh, facing torture. And, and the only issue is give up God deny God and we'll let you go. Or if you, if you don't renounce him, you're going to be tortured and you're going to be killed. And today, 200 Christians will be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's, and they will not deny the faith. And great is their reward and great is their rejoice, rejoicing in Christ. An amazing thing. I hope that if I'm challenged with the same kind of external persecution, that I'll be able to be like the heroes around the world today who are being martyred for their faith. And I hope you will too. So what I want to do now is transition into internal idolatry, because that's where you and I live on a daily basis from the time we get up until the time we go to sleep. And even in our dreaming at night, we battle internal idolatries. So much of what I'm going to share, as a matter of fact, almost all that I'm going to share is from Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit God. So I'm not going to repeat his name over and over again. But if you want a great study 
on internal idolatry that that I think I, I don't think you could possibly read Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller without growing in your faith, without help in eliminating your internal idolatries and falling more in love with Jesus and with the gospel as a result. So highly recommended, uh, great read for you. So again, I'm going to be just reading through the rest of this pretty much, but follow along and again, be in prayerful uh, evaluation of your own life as we go through this. But here's what idolatry looks like today internally, from in the heart, what you and I battle with on the inside on a daily basis. When most people think of idols, they have in mind literal statues, just like we see in Daniel 3, or the next pop star anointed by Simon Kell. Um, Yet, while traditional idol worship still occurs in many places in the world, internal idol worship within the heart is universal. And in Ezekiel 14.3, God says about the elders of Israel, quote, These men have set up their idols in their hearts, end quote. Like us, the elders must have responded to this church. Idols? What idols? I don't see any idols. God was saying that the human heart takes good things like successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. So idols aren't necessarily always sinful things and evil things. Idols very oftentimes can be really good things that even that we need, like food and shelter and clothing. However, if it becomes an ultimate thing, if it becomes something we put before God, that's when we've got to evaluate. So our hearts deify them as the center of our lives because we think they can give us significance, security, safety, and fulfillment if we attain them. And that's when it becomes a, the danger zone of idolatry. Now, I want to read this next uh, few paragraphs. It's very long, but I want you to follow because I think it just so well articulates what the Bible says about this internal idolatry that we struggle with. So again, Keller writes, in the Bible, idolatry includes, of course, the ritual worship of gods other than the true God of Israel. It means to bow down or to kiss the hand or to make sacrifice to the gods of other religions and nations. And that's what we see going on here in Daniel 3. Anyone who does so forfeits God's salvation, according to Jonah 2.8. But the Bible makes it clear that we cannot confine idolatry to literal bowing down before the images of false gods. It can be done internally in the soul and the heart without being done externally and literally. If it is substituting some created thing for God in the heart, in the center of our life, for example, the prophet Habakkuk speaks of the Babylonians whose own sacrifice and burn in incense. And in Ezekiel 16 and Jeremiah 2 to 3, the prophets charge Israel with idolatry because they entered into protective treaties with Egypt and Assyria. These treaties offered the payment of high taxes and political subjugation in exchange for military protection. The prophets considered this idolatry because Israel was relying on Egypt and on, and on Assyria to give them security, the security that only the God could give them. So when King Saul disobeyed the word of the Lord from Samuel and began to conduct business and foreign policy in a way typical of imperialistic powers, the prophet Samuel told him the arrogant, that it was arrogant and disobedience to the Lord, and it was idolatry. In the Bible, then, idolatry is looking to your own wisdom and competence or to some other created thing to provide the power, the approval, the comfort, and security that only God can provide. One of the classic Protestant expositions of idolatry is found in the Puritan David Clarkson's sermon called Soul Idolatry Excludes Man Out of Heaven. And Clarkson distinguishes between external idolatry, which consists of literal bowing down to a physical image, what we see in Daniel 3, and internal idolatry, which consists of an act of the soul. 
when the mind is most taken up with an object and the heart and afflictions most set upon it, this is soul worship and this is the honor due that only the Lord is to have at the first and highest place, both in our minds and our heart endeavors. And then Tim Keller writes about something that we've many of us have seen and we've read, The Lord of the Rings. And in The Lord of the Rings, the central plot of The Lord of the Rings is the dark uh, Lord Sauron's ring of power, which corrupts anyone who tries to use it. However good his or her intentions, the ring is what Professor Tom Shippey calls a psychic amplifier, which takes the heart's fondest desires and it magnifies them to idolatrous proportions. Some good characters in the book want to liberate slaves or persevere their people's land or visit wrongdoers and just uh, punishment with just punishment. And these are all good objectives, but the ring makes them willing to do anything at all. And it turns the good thing into an absolute that overturns every other allegiance and value. The wearer of the ring becomes increasingly enslaved and addicted to it, for an idol is something that we cannot live without. We must have it, and therefore it drives us to break rules. We want honor to harm others and even ourselves in order to get it. Idols are spiritual addictions that lead to terrible evil, both in Tolkien's novel and in the real world. So we have to watch for those things that are good in our life, but if they become ultimate things, if we become addicted to them, if we, if we have to have them, and we'll compromise other uh, things and even sin in the process to get them, that's a sheer sign that idolatry has crept in. So what are some practical ways that we can identify idols in our lives and then replace those? Um, so, so one thing, it's, it, it's impossible to understand our heart and our culture if we don't understand and discern what the counterfeit gods are. That's what Tim Keller calls idols. He says they're counterfeit gods. It's, it's something that's taking the place of the real God, of Yahweh, of Jesus. Uh, when we put something else before him, that's a counterfeit God, little g. And so in Romans 1, 20, uh, 1, 21 to 25, Paul says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the, created, than the creator. And Martin Luther said, Idolatry is always the reason we do anything wrong. Um, he wrote that the Ten Commandments begin with a commandment against idolatry, which we saw earlier in Exodus 20. Um, and, uh, and so why does this come first, uh, the first commandment to not put any other gods before you, to not worship any other gods? He says he argued the fundamental vote motivation behind all law-breaking law is idolatry. And we never break the other commandments without breaking the first commandment. So if we, we break the first and then the others follow, it doesn't go the other way around. You cannot sin without putting something before God or dissing his authority or dissing any of his commandments. What you're doing is you're creating or worshiping or putting first in your life a counterfeit God, a counterfeit uh something that is idolatrous. William Temple once said, your religion is what you do when you're in solitude. And the true God of your heart is what your thoughts effortlessly go to when there's nothing else demanding your attention. So let's look at some ways to discern the idols of our life. Number one, one way to discern your idols is to ask yourself these questions. What do you enjoy daydreaming about? What occupies your mind when you have nothing else to think about? Do you develop potential scenarios about career advancement or material goods such as a dream or a vacation home uh, or a, a relationship with a particular person? 
Uh, one or two daydreams are not necessarily an indication of idolatry, but ask rather, what do you habitually think about to get joy and comfort in the privacy of your home? And then if anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, your meaning, and your identity, identity then that's an, an idol. So secondly, a second way to discern idols is um, discern your heart's true love is to look at how you spend your money. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Matthew 6, 21. Your money flows most effortlessly toward your heart's greatest love. In fact, the mark of an idol is that you spend too much money on it and you must try to exercise self-control constantly. Paul wrote that if God and his grace is the thing in the world you love most, you will give your money away to ministry, charity, and the poor in astonishing amounts. 2 Corinthians 8, 7-9. Most of us, however, tend to overspend on food, clothing, our children, or on status symbols such as our homes, cars, vacations. Uh, so our patterns of spending reveal our idols. And Tim Keller says money isn't an idol, but it shows you where, how you spend it shows you what your idols are. And a simple way to combat this is tithe. I, I mean, I just think it's interesting that tithing is taught in the Old Testament, it's taught in the New Testament, give the first 10% 10, 10 of your income to the church. And if you do that, and I, that's why I like to do automatic pay, because I don't even have to think about it, but I know that every month I'm tithing, and, um, and, I, and I need to live on the other 90%. And what most people do, and if you do this, I, I can just tell you money's an idol in your life. If you do this, if you just give what's left over or, or whatever, and there's no planned giving, I, I can pretty much guarantee you that money is an idol in your life and uh, you need to do business with God. Um, number three, a third way to discern idols works best for those who have professed faith in Christ. You may regularly go to a place of worship. You may have a full, devout set of doctrinal beliefs. You may be trying very hard to believe and obey God. However, what is your real daily functional salvation? What are you really living for? And what is your real, not your professed God? A good way to discern this is how you respond to unanswered prayers uh, and frustrated hopes or dreams. If you ask for something that you don't get, you may become sad and disappointed. Then you go on. Life's not over. Those are not your functional masters. But when you pray and work for something and you don't get it and you respond in explosive anger or deep despair, then you may have found your real God. Like Jonah, you become angry enough to die. So if you add anything to Jesus as a requirement for being happy, then that's your real king or your real uh, God, little G. Number four, a test that Tim Keller says works for everyone, is look at your most uncontrollable emotions. Uh, just as a fisherman looking for fish knows to, knows to go where the water is roiling, look for your idols at the bottom of your most painful emotions, especially those that never seem to lift and that drive you to things you know are wrong. If you're angry, ask, is there anything here too important to me, something I must have at all costs? Do the same thing with strong fear or despair or guilt. Ask yourself, am I so scared because something in my life is being threatened that I think it's, it is a necessity when it's actually not? Am I so down on myself because I've lost or failed at something that I think is necessary uh, when it's not, if you're overworking, driving yourself into the ground with uh, frantic activity, ask yourself, do I feel that I must have this thing in order to be fulfilled and significant? When you ask questions like that, when you pull your emotions up by the roots, as it were, you will find your idols clinging to those roots. David Paulison, a great Christian counselor, says this, that the most basic question which God poses to each human heart 
has something or someone besides Jesus Christ taken title to your heart's functional trust, preoccupation, loyalty, service, fear, and the light? Questions bring some of people's idol systems to the surface. To who or what do you look for life-sustaining stability, security, and acceptance? What do you really want and expect out of life? What would really make you happy? What would make you as an acceptable person? Uh, where do you look for power or control and success? These questions or similar ones tease out whether we serve God, big G, or God's little g, the real God or counterfeit gods. We look for salvation from Christ or from false saviors. And then let me just end with some of these quotes and then how to replace our idols. Anything in life can serve as an idol. It's a God alternative or a counterfeit God. So anything can be an idol. Idolatry happens when we turn good things into ultimate things. In sin, we are always forgetting what God has done for us in Christ and instead are being moved by some other idol. Anything you add to Jesus Christ as a requirement for being happy is an idol that will sap you and it's got to be removed. And the idols of our hearts cannot be removed. They can only be replaced. So how do we replace those internal and external idols of our life? In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he exhorted the Colossian Christians to put to death the evil desires of the heart, including greed, which is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. But how? Here's what he writes in Colossians 3, 1 to 5. He says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is all idolatry. Put them to death. Idolatry is not just a failure to obey God. It's a setting of the whole heart on something besides God. This cannot be remedied only by repenting that you have an idol or using willpower to do something differently. Turning from idols is not less than these two things, but it's far more. Setting the mind and heart on things above where your life is hidden in Christ in God means appreciation, rejoicing, and resting in what Jesus has done for you. It entails joyful worship, a sense of God's reality and prayer. Jesus must become for you more beautiful in your imagination, more attractive to your heart than your idols. That is what will replace your counterfeit gods. Fear-based repentance makes us hate ourselves. Joy-based repentance makes us hate our sin. So if you uproot an idol in your life and you fail to plant the love of Christ, the gospel, what God has done for you in Christ in its place, the idol will always grow back. So I hope you'll join me right now in asking God to replace your idols with him. That Jesus would be first, foremost, greatest, ultimate, that you would find your joy, your satisfaction, your desires, everything with him at the center. Because if you put anything else uh, before that, it's an idol. And what Paul says is kill it, mortify it, destroy it, bury it, but in its place, plant Jesus. So would you join me as we ask God to help us eliminate those idols in our lives. God, thank you for each person who's listening right now. And Lord, I, I pray especially for those who have never fully replaced Jesus in their life with their idols, those who have, never, who have yet to be saved. And I pray that right now 
they would ask Jesus to come into their life, that they would repent of their sin, and that they would put their trust in the one, in the only one who satisfies, in Jesus. And that right now they would ask Jesus to come into their life. Lord, for those of us who have done that, and yet we have blind spots, yet we have um, idols in our hearts, we still have things we dream about, think about, are obsessed with, that we want and we desire so much that we're willing to sacrifice um, our time with you and our commitment to you and our love for you. And we're paralyzed to do anything of, uh, that matters to the kingdom because we're so idolatrous. Lord, please convict us of those sins, of those idols in our lives. And Lord, I pray that we would confess those idols to you. And I ask that you would help us to replace uh, what that space was in our life with those idols, that space with Christ, that we would be in the word, that we would be doers of the word, that we would live for you first and foremost. And God, we want to see you glorified. We want to see you exalted. We want to uh, do things that will last forever. Help us to give our time, our money, our talents to your purposes and Lord, we ask that you would eliminate all the idols of our lives one at a time as you reveal them to us. And Lord, thank you for what you're going to do in each of our lives. Lord, we pray that um, for those of us who are fathers, we would do this for our families. We would do this for our grandchildren. We would, we would model worship, real worship, real um uh, a, co a real commitment and real joy and real satisfaction in you so that our children or our grandchildren would want what we have. And so God, thank you uh, for today. Thank you for a new day. Thank you for a fresh start. And Lord, we ask that you would give us victory over our idols, replace them with Christ, and that we would get tremendous joy as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.